glorious to sing that hymn. What a blessing to sing that Christmas carol. Indications are from worship leaders and musicologists that joy to the world is the most familiar and the most commonly sung Christmas carol at Christmas. But many Christians will be surprised, some perhaps even disappointed, to know that the song we have just sung and cited as our favorite Christmas carol is not actually a Christmas carol at all. The famed hymn writer Isaac Watts published Joy to the World in the year 1719. Millions of Christians sing this song as a great declaration of the truths of Christmas, celebrating the great news of the incarnation and declaring, let earth receive her king. Let every heart prepare him room and heaven and angels sing. At Christmas, we celebrate the incarnation of Christ, the coming of Jesus in Bethlehem. But joy to the world, though sung rightly and triumphantly at Christmas or at any other occasion, is really about the second coming of Christ. Isaac Watts led in the development of hymns in the English tradition, drawing many of his hymn texts directly from the Psalms. Joy to the world is drawn upon Psalm 98 which declares creation's joy when the Lord comes to rule and to judge. When we sing joy to the world, the Lord has come, it applies when we talk about Bethlehem and when we rejoice in the gift of the infant Christ. But the song also reminds us that Christmas isn't over. The promises of Christmas are not fulfilled. Earth will fully receive her king when Christ comes yet again. And when he comes, as the book of Hebrews says, not with reference to sin, but rather he comes to rule and to reign. Think with me, I ask you, about the third verse of this hymn, Joy to the World. We read as we just sang, no more let sins and sorrows grow, nor thorns infest the ground. He comes to make his blessings flow far as the curse is found, far as the curse is found. The reversal of the curse is promised in the coming of the Messiah and in the fulfillment of his atoning work. Implicit in this third verse of joy to the world is the promise of a new creation. We live in light of that promise even as we look back to Bethlehem and as we celebrate Christmas. But look carefully at the reference to the curse. Christ's victory over sin is declared to extend far as the curse is found. What curse? How far does it extend? Where is it found? We find the curse in Genesis chapter 3. After Eve has eaten of the forbidden tree and then Adam also ate, and after they found themselves facing God in the reality of their sin, God first cursed the serpent. The Lord God said to the serpent, Bless, because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and above all beasts of the field. On your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. Because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and above all beasts of the field. On your belly you shall go. This is the first curse. The curse the Lord God delivered unto the serpent who was the tempter. A curse that extends to this serpent and to every single serpent who would follow, right down to the serpents of today who crawl on their bellies in the dust. But secondly, God then cursed the woman. To the woman, he said, I will surely multiply your pain and childbearing. In pain, you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be contrary to your husband, but he shall rule over you. The first curse to the serpent. The second curse to the woman. 
the third curse we need to note to Adam, but not only to Adam, but to Adam as our federal head, not only to Adam, but to all humanity who would follow him. The Lord God said to Adam, as Genesis tells us, to Adam, he said, because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread, till you return to the ground. For out of it you were taken, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return." The serpent is told that he will crawl on his belly in the dust. But in the curse to Adam, the third curse of Genesis chapter 3, it is not only to Adam but to every one of us that we face the curse that we are made of dust and to dust we shall return. The wages of sin is death. By Adam, our federal head, the curse of sin came upon all humanity. We are dust, every single one of us, who must return to the dust, every single one of us. All creation is under the effects of the curse. Notice that the Lord speaking to Adam said, cursed is the ground because of you. Not only is every single human being a sinner under the curse, but every square inch of creation suffers under the curse. The curse is God's righteous judgment of sin, and the effect of the curse is death. The curse has fallen upon all human beings, first because of Adam's sin and then because of our own. In Adam, we all sinned. In Adam, we are all cursed. In Adam, we all died. Where is the curse found? Well, everywhere we look, we see the curse and its malignant effects. How far does it extend? To every single atom and molecule of creation, from coast to coast, horizon to horizon, shore to shore, sky to sky, to every square inch of the planet. That's how far the curse is found. More importantly, every single human being is found under the curse. As Romans chapter 3, verse 23 reminds us, for there is no distinction, for all has sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So let's ask ourselves honestly, how then can we sing joyously joy to the world? Well, we can sing joyously joy to the world because the Lord has come. We turn to Paul's letter to the Galatians chapter 3. Galatians 3 verses 10 through 24. Listen to Paul by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. He writes, For all who rely on works of the law are under a curse. For it is written, Cursed be everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law and do them. Now it is evident, Paul says, that no one is justified before God by the law For the righteous shall live by faith. But the law is not of faith either. The law is not of faith rather. The one who does them shall live by them. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree. So that in Christ Jesus, the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles so that we might receive the promised spirit through faith. So in this text, we find the gospel of Christ, the good news. But first, the bad news. All who rely on works of the law are under a curse. All humanity is born under this curse and under the law. The congregation that originally received Paul's letter would have understood immediately where Paul grounded his argument. In the book of Deuteronomy, in chapter 27 and chapter 28, At the end of the series of curses God delivered from Mount Nebo, we find the most comprehensive of all. 
Cursed be everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law and do them. Now, Paul in Galatians 3, verse 10, is citing Deuteronomy chapter 27, verse 26. We are born under the curse. We are cursed by this curse. And the law offers no escape. We cannot work our way out from under this curse. There is no way we can remove the curse from ourselves. So where is the good news? Where is joy to the world? Look at verses 13 and 14. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. What we sinners could not and cannot do for ourselves, Christ has done for us. He removes the curse and the power of the law to condemn us. How did he do this? He redeemed us from the curse by becoming a curse for us. The sinless Son of God became incarnate as the Word become flesh, the Word who became flesh and dwelled among us. That sinless Son of God became sin for us in order that we might become the righteousness of God. He became a curse for us by hanging on a tree in fulfillment of Scripture. Christ died on the cross in our place, bearing our shame and guilt, paying the full penalty for our sin, dying as our substitute in our place by his shed blood. He redeemed us from the curse by becoming a curse for us. He died our death in our place, bearing our sins, redeeming us from the curse. And on the third day, the Father raised him from the dead. Thus, the cursed and crucified Savior rose victorious from the grave. Paul concludes that all this took place so that in Christ, the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles, to us, and so that we as Christians might receive the promised Holy Spirit through faith. We're gathered here because today we celebrate commencement the graduation of ministers of Jesus Christ who now enter into a new season of service to the church and to the gospel. The main contours of this ceremony would be recognizable to almost anyone. Here you see graduates, diplomas, faculty, academic regalia, dignity, proud loved ones. But this is a distinctively Christian service. This is an academic ceremony, but it is a Christian service of worship. These graduates are one of the most remarkable sights eyes will ever see. Who gets to observe such a moment as this, looking at newly minted ministers of the gospel, newly minted ministers of Christ, and knowing that they are soon to be deployed to the church and to the ends of the earth? No school is worthy of them, and not one of them is worthy of their calling. Everything you observe is by God's grace and to his glory. Graduates, you are wearing the gowns of academic and ministry preparation. You will soon hold diplomas as evidence of your seriousness of preparation and devotion to the ministry. You are surrounded by a host of friends and family and faculty. Their own hopes and dreams of ministry go with you and they go in you. This faculty has taught you with conviction. This faculty has taught you with affection. And now you go to bear the gospel of Christ and to preach the word. Why? Here's why. Because the world is full of sinners who live every day under the curse. And because the penalty of the curse is death. You go to preach the gospel and to declare salvation to all who believe in Christ and who repent of their sin. You go to feed Christ's flock and to shepherd the church for whom Christ died. We're gathered here because Jesus saves. We are gathered here because on the cross, he bore the full penalty for our sin. We are gathered here because Christ our substitute died for us the death that was rightly ours. We are here because we celebrate this gospel. 
We are here because we are ready to send these graduates out to preach, to teach, and to tell this gospel. But we're also here because in this service of worship, the greatest hope of these graduates would be that if there be anyone here, even this morning, who does not yet know Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord, that you would come to know that even now you are under the curse of sin. And that you would know even now the wages of the curse is death. But that you would know even now what it means to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, knowing that he died in our place on the cross and shed his blood for the remission of our sins and was raised on the third day by the power of the Father. We would want you to know These graduates would especially want you to know that you too can know salvation through Jesus Christ our Lord. By believing in him and repenting of your sins, you too can know what it means to be given the gift of everlasting life, to be forgiven your sins, to be made right with God, and to escape by means of Christ becoming a curse for you, for you to escape from the curse. Now you know why we sing joy to the world at Christmas. It's not only familiar to us, it declares the great truths of the gospel all the way from the promise of a Savior to his eventual promised reign and rule. How far does the gospel reach? To what lengths must the gospel be taken? You know, it's answered right in the third verse of this hymn far as the curse is found. Go and preach. Go and tell. Take the good news that Christ has redeemed us from the curse by becoming a curse for us. Take the message of the gospel of Christ far as the church, far as the curse is found. How far is the curse found? Everywhere you can possibly go to every human being you can possibly meet. We take and tell and teach the gospel far as the curse is found. Joy to the world, the Lord is come. Let earth receive her king. No more let sins and sorrows grow, nor thorns infest the ground. He comes to make his blessings flow far as the curse is found. And so, prayerfully, and so, proudly, we send you out, ministers of Christ, soldiers of truth, heralds of the gospel, we send you out far as the curse is found.